Connor, and we're each going to be talking about different aspects of this project. So we're talking really about our faculty focused approach to asynchronous staff professional learning for, for Moodle. OK, so moving on, I'm going to talk briefly about why we took a faculty focused approach in the IOE, the education faculty of DCU. Connor's going to talk about what we actually did and Suzanne's going to flag some of the uh, future plans that we have for what we've done. We're also going to link it to the DigComp EDU framework, um, but just moving on quickly. So why did we take a faculty focused approach? We were like lots of us faced with that sudden pivot to online this time last year. We muddled through with the support of our teaching enhancement colleagues in the university. When we got to the end of that first semester, I was charged with leading a working group in the faculty, which was set up to support staff in reconceptualizing their modules and programs for the hybrid approach that will be used in the academic year 2020-21. So this developed very quickly over the late summer. The working group comprised members right across the faculty. Obviously, we had people who had expertise and experience in teaching and learning online, but we also crucially wanted to have people involved who had very little or no experience of online teaching and learning. That's uh, really the reason we chose this image here, because we felt that in developing this faculty focused Moodle page, we wanted to illustrate the importance of perspective and trying to view things from different angles. We were aware that some of our colleagues had never taught online, and while we were all faced with the same challenge, namely the hybrid approach for 2021, we were maybe all in a boat, but maybe different kinds of boats, and we were looking for different kinds of things. So this happened very quickly, and we realized in the working group that setting up a Moodle page for the faculty would be a central aspect of the support for staff. So I'm going to just flag a few key elements of that. One of the key elements, I think, was the synergy and insights that we brought because of our different roles and perspectives within the faculty on the university. As the Associate Dean for Teaching and Learning in the IOE, I have a pretty good handle on teaching and learning in the faculty and the programmes, as did my colleague Connor Sullivan, who's the Chief Technical Officer in the IOE, and Suzanne Stone, our colleague who has worked for many years with IOE staff and was our designated TEU body um, at this time. A second key principle, and I flagged it already, was that we started with the basics. In creating the Moodle page for the faculty, we realized it was important not to overwhelm staff. And we spoke, for example, about bringing them to the next step in their development. So one little thing, maybe supporting staff in reconceptualizing their traditional face-to-face -face module delivered on campus, on the physical campus, as a Moodle book. So we weren't really pushing the more complex Moodle activities and resources like H5P, like the database and the lesson and so on. The discussion forum was a key part of the faculty page. We knew that staff who wanted information and resources relating to those most, more complex tools would ask for them. We noticed, interestingly, that over time, that the more advanced users in the faculty made good use of the discussion forum. They shared experiences, they shared questions, they weren't constrained, they looked for specific things, for example, enrolling part-time staff members in Zoom and so on. We actively encourage the use of that discussion forum. If staff emailed us, either Connor, Suzanne or myself with a query, we really pushed them to put that on the discussion forum. In a sense, we maybe choreographed the discussion forum a little bit um, in that we, we modeled using it ourselves. We uh, encouraged others to share their ideas. So there were lots of interesting discussions on the discussion forum about things that were immediately important. Balancing synchronous and asynchronous approaches to teaching and learning, breakout rooms, part out staff, and so on. We should have set it up as an auto subscription. That was a key learning. I didn't do that, so it was a bit after the fact. A third principle, there were loads of existing resources out there. The TEU Teaching Enhancement Unit in the university has a staff support and a student support loop page. So we weren't going to be reinventing wheels. We didn't have time to develop resources. So a key part was Suzanne was able to support in, in importing existing resources. But I suppose there's loads of resources in those support pages. The beauty of this was that we were able to identify resources that would be relevant to our faculty at this time. So they weren't going to be overwhelmed. We were tailoring it to, their, to what we thought they needed. An aligned kind of focus of it was that we had, I had 
um, got a lot of messages from staff saying, you know, we really appreciate updates from you as ADTL, updates from the Teaching Enhancement Unit, but it would be great to have a one-stop shop for resources and materials that we could go back to rather than searching through emails all the time. So we were running some of these targeted training and workshops at the time, so the Moodle page became a hub for those. And over time, Connor might talk more about that a little bit later, we also imported lots of other resources, GDPR training, research ethics training, so everything was centrally there. I'm going to stop at that point. I was going to link it to the DigComp EDU framework, but just in brief, uh, enhancing communication in the, in the, the, the faculty, sharing um, expertise and knowledge, hopefully over time, reflective practice, linking it forward to what we do next year and how we develop it next year and digital CPD. Handing over to, to Connor now, who's going to talk about what we actually did. And I'm going to move the slide on. Great, thanks a million, Anna. So, um... Yeah, I, as you said, I, I'm going to chat about what we did and it will link back to a lot of the things that Anna said. I suppose our first image there is we put ourselves in the learner's shoes or in the staff's shoes to see what they actually need. So in terms of what kind of course um, structure, what categories um, to do so that for people who are just beginning their journey of um, going online and for other people who are kind of further along that journey so that they know kind of where to go um and not to frighten them kind of as well so we came up with four um four distinct categories uh one was teaching online the next one was layout structure of your loop course or your loop classroom the next one was uh, student learning and engagement and then finally we had assessment and feedback so it went from just the basics of what teaching online is to how to structure a course to a bit more to getting students engaged and then for the kind of more advanced users um assessment and feedback the kind of more tricky things on on um, Moodle. Sorry, we we call them um, Moodle Loop in, in DCU. Um, so there was a short time frame um, to set up these things, and, and we also had other work to do, obviously as well. So the TU, our Teaching Enhancement Unit, had a lot of resources already. So we just made use of a lot of them, and we made a few little tweaks. Um, we could import them into our course, no problem, and and just tweak them uh, for our users. Um, and also, because I, I'm a technical officer in the school, and Anna, as she said there, um, is a dean for teaching and learning, we kind of, we hear um, people asking questions all the time. And, you know, so we kind of had a good idea of what they needed and, and what we needed to put our energy in to create. So that was mainly kind of things around them, um, like videos, um, as in recording your own video, how you share your own video. And the difference between screencasts and podcasts, so like the teaching enhancement unit had uh, things on screencasts, but um, they didn't have anything on podcasts, so we developed just what's the difference between them and how to make your own podcasts. And then even for staff, they um, when they put resources up onto Moodle, they just add them as, as a resource instead of kind of embedding them either within something as simple as a label or a book. So we, we had some of them resources as well. Um, we also from listening to what the staff needs where we also plan to do some sessions um, on loop on a, sorry Moodle books on a zoom breakout rooms and, and VVox as well and that was with support from our, our colleagues in the teaching enhancement unit. And um, so we had resources from that were already made and we also made um, resources ourselves and as well, so we didn't make all resources available because um, we didn't want to overwhelm staff and especially there were a kind of a basic kind of foundational set of resources in each of the categories so if somebody just wanted to see how to set up their course they'd go into that section and they'd, they'd have a few resources but what we'd nearly um always do as as anna said there was that we direct people to the discussion forum because they'd always email me with questions and, and I'd, I'd get back to people straight away with, with answers. Um, so I don't like work sitting on my desk, but I found it hard um, to do this, but I, I think it was a key thing for what we did is that I said to them here, I'm not going to give you the answer. Can you go off to the discussion forum and ask that? Because I know there's plenty of other people who have that same question. And there's also plenty of people who would be able to give you more advice than what I'd be able to give you. So we really did direct people to that discussion forum. And we also, we did approach people and say, hey, you know a lot about this. Can you go onto the forum and, and answer questions on, on this and so on? So it was really about directing people to the forum. And then as they asked them questions, we'd link to the 
resources within the forum and then also make them available on the course page as well. So it became kind of quite an organic growth of the of the Moodle course. Um, there was stuff like practical questions on Zoom, breakout rooms, screencasts, and um, people were asking about channels of communication, like um, just say if Moodle went down, how do we share a Zoom link? So all of them questions came up from, from staff in our, in our institute. Um, creating space to check in on students. So things that we wouldn't really think of, because um, I suppose from my point of view, I'm, I'm a very practical and technical person. So, you know, th those kind of other areas that came um, that came up from staff were, were very beneficial. I think we had 18 posts onto our forum and 40 replies. So it was quite well subscribed. And I suppose as soon as people started teaching, they, they said, right, well, this is, we have exactly what we need now. And they went teaching. So the forum died down, but um, we will look at obviously getting it um, going again. And then, yeah, as um, as I said, yeah, we just linked the, the, all the resources from the forum so that um, they were there for people to come back then and look at them then. Okay, so I'll hand over to Suzanne then. Lovely. Uh, thanks a million, Connor and Anna. Um, so uh, I guess our future plans are based on building uh, on, on the strengths of what we did uh, to date. And what we really want to do is just strengthen that the... the um, the space as a, as a learning uh, environment for, for staff in the IOE. Uh, Anna mentioned very briefly that um, the, the DigiComp Edu framework and this work really connects to area number one of that framework, professional engagement. And what we want to focus on specifically is professional collaboration through the discussion forum and reflective practice also through this discussion forum. Uh, Connor mentioned already that that you know one of the approaches that we had was not to hand people the answer directly, but to direct them to the the discussion forum, and ask them to engage in that way. So it's it's a slightly choreographed approach, as Anna mentioned earlier, but I think that we'll we'll continue on with that approach because it does allow us to weave in um, the resources into the discussion forum. It allows others to see the the, the recurring issues that are coming up, as Connor mentioned. Uh, so I think that we will, we, we, to date, that's our plan, that we will we'll continue with that approach. Uh, the next thing that we want to do is evaluate the resources as they stand to date. I mean, that's always an ongoing pro process for, um, for any space that you, you want to develop as a professional learning environment. And I saw a couple of comments earlier in the chat box, just to clarify that the space it's not constructed as as a course a self-directed course in the in the traditional way it's really a hub i think anna mentioned the the term hub it's a hub of resources uh, with that uh, additional kind of discussion forum and connection space uh, so it, it's a moodle page um uh, just to clarify that but we need to obviously evaluate the, the resources that are available there, make sure that they're still relevant to the context. You know, as we move away from the initial pivot, obviously people's needs change. That's an ongoing piece of work. We have spoken about how we can actually um, make that piece of work uh, as efficient as possible. And we've spoken about possibly developing a, a shared um, space for those of us uh, involved from the teaching enhancement unit, the central services unit in the university, and then Connor and Anna at the Institute of Education, the, the, the particular faculty, and then others that we've drawn resources from, such as um, ISS or, or, or um, uh, other resources, such as perhaps the library at points, we may be directing people to, to resources from the library as well. And then the third thing that we want to do is continue sharing the learning. So Anna mentioned already and, and Connor mentioned um, uh, aspects of that kind of shared learning. It, I'm working with the, the central services unit, the teaching enhancement unit, and we have our own kind of university wide uh, learning space as well. But the, the idea of the, 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 the shared learning uh, continuing, one example that Connor mentioned was we didn't have a resource around podcasts created for our particular university-wide um, learning space. And we borrowed um, from the IOE uh, resources then for our own. So that kind of, even though initially th this 
uh, faculty space would have drawn uh, on the, the central resources. That sharing is a, is a two way process there, and we want to continue very much uh, in that um, in that vein. And just finally, just to say that the collaborative, I think, from all of our point of view, we've spoken about this um, very kind of casually, but the learning and working together and that collaborative effort, it really is a rich experience. And given that we were all kind of thrown in very much at the deep end with the, the, the pivot to, to remote and online learning, um, I think it was it was great to have support from colleagues and and for me to get the insight from the the Institute of Education at faculty level and, and the particular needs there and to feedback that that uh, to my colleagues and to the resources that we were developing. Uh, that's uh, pretty much it. Um, what? Oh, thank you, Anna. Yep. The slides are available at this bit.ly link and we'll pop the, the link into the chat box now as well. Please feel free to reach out to any of us if you want to continue the conversation. And I think, Mark, we have um, a couple of minutes for questions as well now. <laughs>